first got involved in martial arts when I was a teenager. I was about 14. And my first introduction to it was through a local taekwondo club uh, that was starting up near my house. And I think at the time, my interest was in learning some self-defense. You know, I think there's the same sorts of reasons that a lot of people get involved in it. And I just found it was it was something that grabbed me, uh, it was something that I enjoyed doing. And I, I developed this fascination with, um, I suppose, the idea of uh, learning to fight, if you like. Um, when I went to university, I tried out a few different martial arts. I suppose that was the time when I started realising that there was more to fighting than just one particular style of martial arts. So I, I did some traditional jiu-jitsu, a bit of judo, um, one or two other things. And um, after doing that for a few years, that's when I, I found out about mixed martial arts. And it was a time when I was starting to do a little bit of teaching in some of these different styles. And I think the thing that always bothered me about it was that I didn't know what it was actually like to be in a fight. You know, I'd, I, I'd never had to use it for self-defense. Um, so I think I felt that I couldn't really tell other people with any confidence that this is going to work. Um, and I think that's, that's about the time when I sort of found out about the UFC, you know, the, the original UFCs, with the idea of it being a, a test of different combat styles and, you know, what works in a, in a relatively realistic scenario. Uh, and immediately when I saw that, I thought, this is something that I want to have a go at. So, uh, so that's when I started looking around for somewhere to train MMA and, you know, got involved in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, went from one thing to another and um, ended up uh, having some professional fights. And again, I mean, I, I think I got into it with the idea of I want to test myself, but I wasn't really planning on making a career or, you know, taking it very far. I just wanted to see what it was like and then go back to what I was doing. Okay, and, so... Uh you might say that your expectation was that you mm -hmm. would learn to fight to mm -hmm. defend yourself and somewhat that was dis disproved in uh, like traditional martial arts like uh, taekwondo and such again i, I think it was i mean that, that that was something that i've been looking for you know, I think the the idea or the, the confidence of uh, feeling like I could defend myself or feeling like if I ended up in a fight, I, I would know how to deal with it. Um, and I think that that was what I was looking for coming into mixed martial arts. And then when I, the more I learned about it and the more I, um, I got involved in it, the more I saw that there was to learn. And I started thinking, well, I wonder how good I could get at this. You know, I wonder how far I could go with it. And I suppose that's the uh, the question I was I was trying to answer, um, and uh, that took me all over the world and had a lot of uh, very interesting experiences. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I'm not sure whether I'm any closer to answering that question. I think I think my idea of the question has changed um, along the way. <laughs> it's like the goalposts keep moving. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's, it's certainly a lot of uh, had a lot of very interesting experiences. Uh, uh, a regular person maybe do not know what it's like to be a professional athlete, mm. and not even on uh, in martial arts. Mm. So, what would you say? What does it takes to do MMA on a professional level it might seem like a lot of f fun but that maybe not is the case any misconceptions that the general public might have you think yes um, I mean I think I've always said you have to be a little bit crazy to be involved in this sport and I'll, I'll stand by that <laughs> um, I think I mean the highs are incredible, you know, the good bits about it are incredible. Um, and I've been incredibly privileged to, to have those experiences. Um, but also, you know, the, the tough bits are really tough. Um, and I think there's, 
being a professional fighter is very different from or being a professional athlete of any kind, I think, is different from training that sport for fun and for as a hobby. So I think as soon as it becomes your profession, your relationship to it changes. Uh, and when it becomes it's an obligation, so you have to do it. Um, and you you have to, um, you know, you have to get out of bed in the morning and go and train, whether you feel like it or not. And, you know, sometimes even if you're you're injured, if you're sick, you have to work through that. And I think that, you know, that that makes it hard. And sometimes that can take the fun out of it, you know. Um, it's it's a very different thing from sort of going down to the gym a couple of times a week after work as, as a hobby, as, as relaxation, you know. Um, and as, with... With being a professional fighter, I think there's a lot of other things that go along with it that perhaps people don't see. You know, in addition to all the the training you have to put in, the, the fight camps, um, I mean, there's the dieting, there's the nutrition. Um, and like I said, when you when you're trying to get through a fight camp um, and lose weight at the same time, you know, and obviously you've got the stress of you know knowing that your performance in that fight, how it goes, is good, that's going to affect your career. It's going to affect your ability to pay the bills. Um, you've got all the pressure of dealing with the media dealing with the general public um and all of those other things so that makes it 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 puts a very different light on things um i mean at the same time you know there's there have been some incredible moments you know the things that i've had the chance to do that i wouldn't have i wouldn't have done without it and I, I wouldn't for a minute, you know, I don't, I don't regret having done that. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't want to be seen to be complaining about anything, but it's it's highs and lows, you know. I think you, you make that trade-off. You, uh, um, but yeah, I, that's, that, that's the best way I can put it. Okay. Um, I guess uh, <laughs> there is some level of boredom also in uh, the profession of martial arts. Um, I mean, I think with with any sport, um, I mean, obviously, you know, it involves sort of training the basics. To, I mean, to the point where that they're instinctive. You know, it's you've you've got to know that under pressure, when you know there's you've, you're in there, you've got the fans. You know, there's a lot going on around you. You're being punched in the face. You've got you're tired, you're struggling to get your breath back, you know that your responses are still going to be the right ones. You know, And to get to that stage involves drilling it past the point where you're bored with it. You know, yeah. point where it just happens without you even having to think about it. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, that's... I, I don't think that's unique to mixed martial arts. You know, I think that's unique to doing anything at a high level really you know any any sport and a lot a lot of other skills as well you know i think there's a, a lot of jobs that involve um performing at that incredibly high level you know um i think you have to um you have to be prepared to put up with that you have to do the things that go along with it um it's the routine that to get you through those difficult moments it's not it's not the flashes of brilliance it's what you're doing sort of day in day out um along the way and i think sort of realizing that that's actually the um that's the key to high high level performance mm. i think that's um you know i think that's a big part of it um but, but yeah like i said I think, I think the same is true for you know it's, it's certainly true for other athletes it's probably true for people like surgeons for example you know anyone who's having to having to function sort of reliably at a high level uh, about outside pressure as, uh, in being a somewhat public person mm. uh, you said earlier that you are putting too much value on being me uh, do, do you consider that hard as being out in the um, public media I think it can be I mean I think it can be I mean the public is fickle you know, I think if you base, I mean, it's it's very easy to get tired of basing 
your ego and your sense of self on how other people see you and how how you're perceived by the public and i think it's a it it there's a danger there because it is a fickle thing and you know you you have a good day and suddenly everyone thinks you're wonderful and you know everyone's telling you how great you are and you have a bad day and suddenly you know everyone's uh, slating you on twitter and it, being able to deal with both of those things and not get too carried away with either one and sort of realizing that you know you, your good days aren't as good as everyone thinks they are and your bad days aren't as bad as everyone thinks they are and actually the reality is somewhere in the middle yeah. and a lot of it depends on outside circumstances it depends on all kinds of other things and sort of having that you know being fairly grounded in yourself i think that that's important and it's a difficult skill to to get the hang of you know i mean i i certainly wouldn't say that i'm there yet you know, I think I recognise uh, perhaps when I'm when I'm getting carried away with things a bit more than I used to, and you can certainly see that. I mean, it's easier to see when other people do it than when you when when I'm doing it myself. You know, I think that's always the way. You know, we we notice other people's mistakes much more easily than our own. Um, but uh, but yeah, you know, I, th- I think that's um, that's something that that's, that's that's tough. I think, um, I mean, with, with social media these days, I think athletes are much more accessible than at any, any time in the past, you know, particularly in MMA, you know, MMA is a very, um, a very accessible sport, really, you know, in most sports, you don't have a situation where people can walk into a gym and they could be training with the, potentially with some of the best fighters in the world, you know, some of the top guys in the world. Um, and they're they're on the mat on a regular basis with uh, people who may be just doing it as a recreational activity, um, and uh, there isn't that much separation, you know, between between the public and the fighters. And I think because of that, it is very easy to get tied up in what other people are thinking or what other people are saying. And certainly with the internet, it it, it becomes a little bit like um, you know you're listening in on a conversation that's about you. Um, but because you know, because it's going on on the internet, you can actually read it. And um, I'm not sure that this is a, this is a particularly healthy thing. Um, it's it's a hard temptation to resist. You know, you sort of wanting to know what other people are saying about you, wanting to know what other people are thinking. Um, but at the same time, like I said, I think um, it's easy to get wrapped up in that. You know, and I mean, especially with the negative comments and things, it's it's very easy to get you might get nine positive comments and one negative one but for most people the one they'll focus on will be the negative one and I think I mean that's partly to do with you know how we tend to think you know how our brains are wired um that sort of focus on on the negative a little bit um but uh, but yeah I think it, it it does make your view of um of things may be a little bit uh, a little bit skewed let's say yeah Every day life goes on on every way uh, anyways you might say mm. yeah uh, you might say you have a parallel career at least you have a phd mm. in theoretical computer science <laughs> <laughs> i i, uh, I um, thought can you explain that in like layman's terms might be a hard task <laughs> it that's a tricky one um i mean, basically i did maths um it was uh, i ended up in the computer science department because i mean there's um there was a small group of sort of mathematicians working on one particular area um and i understand that it has some applications to computing but I'm not really that hot on exactly what those applications are. Yeah, you know, basically what I was doing was maths, um, and uh, it, it was sort of a, um, it was a kind of set theory, really, if you like it. Um, I think my my PhD is actually available on the internet, but I wouldn't particularly recommend it unless you're having trouble sleeping. Um, <laughs> well, it probably makes a good paperweight, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or you know maybe wrapping paper, uh, but if you've got any mathematician friends. Um. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but like in in general, I reckon you have a passion for maths. Um, one math teacher said to me that 
math is somewhat of is a art. Do you agree? Ah, uh, I think you, you can certainly see it that way. Yeah. You know, I think um, again, it's it's one of those things where I think you know the the borders between art art and science you know maybe um i'm not sure i'm not sure in some cases how helpful that distinction is i think um i think in terms of ways of thinking you know i think um creativity is important you know obviously in maths and, and, and throughout the sciences you know i think that's important and i, th I think there's a, there's a lot of overlap between you know different fields of study you know i, I don't necessarily agree with this view where everything's sort of pigeonholed into a, you know one bucket or the other you know i think it, it's um i think it's useful for everyone to have an experience of you know all the different ways of thinking and different um different approaches to to knowledge so um i perhaps don't find that distinction all that useful uh, okay um things should be uh accessible for everyone you might say like uh, both arts and uh, the science yeah I mean I think it's uh, um, yeah I, 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 I think it's useful to have a grounding in in, in both yeah uh, uh, well for it's a term called intersubjectivity mm. Um, can you attach this to this uh, argument or arguments that uh, even uh, even artist should be able to read a science paper in some extent? Mm, absolutely. I mean, I, th I think I think scientific literacy is something that's be that's hugely important um, in in our. In our culture, and I think it's it's becoming increasingly so. You know, the impact of technology on um, on society, and I think being able to make sensible decisions about you know how we're going to interact with that technology and how um, you know and, uh, and and how to interpret a lot of the scientific understanding that the scientists are giving us. You know, I, th I think it's important for. For the general public to understand that, um, so I mean, I, I'm always a strong advocate for for critical thinking, for yeah. you know, for for a general understanding of science. Um, you know, being able to read at least you know the outline of a science scientific paper and to understand what's going on, um, because I think that it does affect our lives to such a such a large extent. Um, so I, th I think that's something that. Ideal, you know, every, everyone should have should have a ground again. Um, and equally, you know, I think I think arts are important as well. You know, I think everyone should have um, some kind of understanding of you know arts and literature and other. Um, I mean, yeah, things like um, music and history and no. everything. You know, I mean, I, I always um, like the the quote by the uh, sci-fi author uh, Robert. Um, Robert Heinlein, where he says that he, he argues that specialization is for insects. Yeah, he says, okay. a, a human being should be able to, and he, he lists this long list of things that uh, a human being should be able to do. And you know, you, we can you could probably update it and argue that some of those are more important than others. But I think the principle that you know having having a, a wider base of understanding and you know exposure to all those different things. Um, I think that that can only be helpful. Yeah, I guess that was what you might call uh, like well, values of the Renaissance, <laughs> or at least <laughs> perceived. Yeah. yeah. I mean, at the same time, you know, I, I do understand the benefits of specialization, and you know, as things become increasingly complex, you know, we we can't specialize in everything. You know, mm -hmm. we need people who who do specialize in, say, medicine or surgery or, you know, science uh, or whatever. I think you. you, you Having that field that you know is, is what you do or what you concentrate on, I think that's important as well. But at the same time, having a, a broader understanding of the context in which you're doing that. Um, yeah. 
uh, and then we want to think of critical thinking uh, in uh, in the la large scope. You, it, it is a question of democracy mm. to be able to question those in power and, mm. and such. You agree? That's yeah, I think, and, and being able to look at an argument and to evaluate that argument on its own own merits, you know, without, um, I mean, I think a lot of the time what pe people all too often are swayed by very emotional arguments and very, you know, um, and, and sort of quite superficial um, or quite shallow arguments, if you like, yeah. rather than actually being able to sort of look a bit deeper and see, you know, does this make sense? And does this all add up? Um, I mean, particularly you see, for example, the argument about immigration at the moment, which yeah. is you know, some of the right wing parties are kind of trying to um, to cash in on that, if you like, and trying to sway people by by promoting this idea that, uh, you know, immigrants are coming over here and taking our jobs and things like this. Yeah. I think, you know, being able to look at that sort of argument and say, well, does this actually make sense? And yeah. You know, does this add up? Um, is this saying what these people would like us to say? And, and again, looking sort of through that and seeing, you know, what agenda do these people have? You know, why is this person trying to get me to think this? And, you know, what's going on? And, you know, being able to sort of reason through things like that and, and come to a balanced view on rather than sort of, jumping on the bandwagon because it's pushing pushing some emotional buttons i think you know that's that's an important skill you know i think that's something that's um unfortunately not given maybe enough um enough importance sometimes uh, yeah yes um the lure, lure of national they say uh, is often that it's it doesn't um, crave something f from its uh, participants, like mm. to be a nationalist in Sweden, the only thing you have to be is Swedish. <laughs> and uh, and, mm. uh, and, uh, vice versa, and the same in any other country. Like, it's very easy. It's the mm. easy road, road, you might say. Mm. Okay. I, I, yeah, I, I think... Um... You know, you see, you see this all over the place. You know, it's, I mean, it's this modern obsession with clickbait, if you like. But I mean, really, clickbait has been going on for much longer than there's been social media. Yeah. You know, I think it, it was, you see that uh, things that push people's emotional buttons sell newspapers. You know, they, yeah. it, it gets people's interest on TV shows. You know, if you can, if you can get someone to feel strong emotions, even if those emotions aren't necessarily pleasant. You know, if you can get somebody to feel outrage or to, you know, be shocked or, I mean, it'll grab their attention. And, you know, it'll make them buy that newspaper or, you know, tune into that TV show. And I think it, it, it unfortunately, it means that that sort of um, media environment becomes increasingly shallow because it's made up of people sort of trying to push those buttons just to get that instant reaction. And like I said, I think, you know, clickbait is that phenomenon when you applied to social media you know it's how can i get somebody to to click that link um or to you know and it's it, it's it's really very formulaic you know it, it doesn't take much in the way of sort of skill or you know, to, to to actually just get that initial oh let me see what that's about um so i think you know it's it's kind of depressing in a way you know that um that it is so easy to, to push people's buttons and to get people to to pay attention to to something like that. And I think, you know, maybe looking a little bit deeper than that, I think is, uh, you know, can be beneficial. Yeah. Uh, George Orwell had the uh, term newspeak. Mm. <laughs> mm. Maybe it has in some extent become, become re reality. Do you experience that? I think so. I mean, to some extent. I mean, I think if you... I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, there's the, the novel 1984. It gives a particular view of the future. 
you know, where people are sort of terrorized into uh, falling in line with, um, you know, with, with the approved way of thinking, and you know, and what Big Brother wants them to do. Um, but actually, I mean, I remember when I was, um, I think it was when I was doing my English GCSE, writing a, as they sort of comparing 1984 with um, Aldous Huxley's book, uh, Brave New World. I think actually, if you look at the vision for the future that Brave New World presents, in, in many ways, it's actually closer to what we've got, you know, where people aren't terrorised into um, thinking the approved thing or to falling in, into line. It's people become absorbed in, in because, because of the way they're being presented, you know, because, I mean, um, I think, you know, Brave New World makes the point that um, you don't need to ban books. You just make sure that nobody has any interest in reading them. And, uh, you know, if, when you when you look at the sort of superficial nature of a lot of uh, a lot of media and you know, a lot of what's going on, you kind of it, it, there's a lot of parallels there. Um, I think it, it's interesting. You know, I mean, it, in some ways it, it looks like a less sinister view of uh, the future. But at the same time. I think there's some there is something quite terrifying there because there isn't there isn't any there isn't a feeling of the need to rebel against something people because people feel like they're doing what they're being led into doing what they feel like they want to do um, so it's sort of being seduced by uh, I suppose you know the, the whole uh, bread and circuses thing. No. Um, uh, so what would you say then is the real life today's equivalent of the drug soma from a uh, brave new world <laughs> oh <laughs> i mean there's lo there's lots of possibilities there aren't there you know um, the sun i don't know <laughs> <laughs> well like i said i mean i, th I think i think you know there's a, there's a lot of media that falls into that category um uh, there's uh, it's it's all too easy to get to get sucked into. Yeah. Facebook. Yeah. Um. <laughs> um, so. uh, and another subject, mm. literature again. Mm. Um, I guess you're a fan of Haruki Murakami. I've I've read a little of his. Um, I keep, uh, I keep being recommended other books that he's written, and he's certainly a, a writer that I enjoy. So I'm going to be. I've got a, a list of his his work on my my reading list at the moment. Um, I'm just reading uh, what I talk about when I talk about running at the moment by him. Uh, it's sort of more autobiographical. Um, he, he sort of, I think he talks about his experience of both running and also writing. Um, it's quite interesting, you know. It's, uh, it's interesting looking at sort of both the parallels and the difference from you know, my experience with a different, a very different sport. Um, you know, and there's, there's some things which seem familiar there to me and there's some things which seem very different. Um, but uh, I always yeah. find it interesting sort of seeing how people approach their work and, you know, how, their, how they go about things. I find that. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I have read it too. I guess his main point is that mm. also writing is like a marathon because it's, uh, if I remember right, it's, it's, it's marathon running that this is long mm. distance. Yes. Like chipping away a little bit every day. Um, maybe not cram. Yeah, yeah. So that sense of in, endurance, you know, that pacing yourself and. Uh -huh. I think he, I mean, he talks about developing a, a writing routine and, you know, his, the process he goes through when he's, when he's writing something. Um, so I, he's a very quotable author, you know, every so often I'll, I'll read something and I'll think, oh, that's brilliant. Um, I, I end up putting up a lot of these quotes on, you know, my Facebook and social media and no. thing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I've, I, I think he he's got a lot of interesting interesting stuff to say. Yeah, a lot of what he says sounds. He just sort of looks at everyday life and looks at you know the sort of experiences that. I mean, maybe not everyone's had the experience of necessarily 
running a, a marathon or an ultra marathon or a triathlon or whatever. But I think he, he talks about it in a way that a lot of people can identify with. Yeah. Internet gnomes, I guess. <laughs>